So in 1957, May 13th, it really came to the attention of Americans when millions of copies of Life magazine were delivered to their homes. Now this is in the middle of the Cold War, and in this was the first uh, first description of the use of mushrooms as visionary medicines, uh, and featured Maria Sabina, uh, and um, had and was written by R. Gordon Wasson, who is featured here. Um, and even though that the village was disguised, um, thousands and you know, tens of thousands of Americans uh, began their trek into Mexico seeking the magic mushrooms. So amazingly, in Life magazine was a botanically very accurate field guide <laughs> on how to identify Psilocybe cubensis, Psilocybe serulescens, Psilocybe zapaticorum, uh, on and on. So, I mean, this is just amazing uh, because it's a super conservative time and this magazine ends up, you know, on the, on the doorsteps of millions of Americans. Now, in the academic circles, this, this caused an uproar uh, and the intelligentsia of that time uh, then really picked up the ball and uh, professors at the University of California, Berkeley, at Harvard, Cornell, Yale, lots of people started going down to Mexico to, to look for magic mushrooms. And then in the mid-1970s, uh, a number of books came out um, that reflected the interest in these mushrooms, particularly on the west coast of North America. Um, Jonathan's book was the first book really to come out that, uh, that had decent descriptions and accurate taxonomic information. Uh, the Terrence, Terrence, Terrence McKenna uh, and Dennis McKenna's book, and they wrote under the pseudonym uh, Austin Eric, Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide, was the single most tour de force uh, cultivation manual that you know caused and or helped create this revolution of cultivating Slosby cubensis in closets. I call it the Slosby cubensis scholarship fund. And I have know many many people who finance their tuitions through colleges by growing Slosby cubensis in their closets. Uh, so I mean they owe they owe a debt to Slosby cubensis for their education. Uh, and then there's there's a number of other books, Growing Wild Mushrooms. This is on the, the, second, uh, the second International Conference on Psychoactive Mushrooms. And then of all books that come out, it was this, one of the strangest books is, is The Golden Guide to Hallucinogenic Plants. Go figure. I mean, I don't know how. This, this, the Golden Guide series is marketed to children, if you don't know this. And so how this book ever got past the editors and got published is still a mystery to me. <laughs> then Stephen Pollack produced this book, and this is my first book that was uh, published in 1976. Um, and then uh, this led to uh, a lot of people going to Mexico to look for the magic mushrooms. And this is Manuel Torres. Uh, and these are relatively small specimens, but perfectly adequate for spore prints of Psilocybe cubensis. And then the, the revolution and growing magic mushrooms at home began. Uh, and Psilocybe cubensis cultivation in the United States primarily started as, as in jars. Um, you know, the huge amounts of Mason and Kerr canning jars were being ordered, by, you know, by the hundred case low, uh, low directly from the factories. I'm sure that the, these two companies did not mind. Um, and Slossium cubensis could be grown in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the more popular ways now in North America is in the months of July, August, and September, uh, what we call leached cow manure, which is uh, when they use separators to separate the roughage from the urea and they spray back the urea uh, slurry back onto the fields, they create this, these huge piles of roughage material. And uh, many keen cultivators have discovered that these piles heat up naturally by themselves. They self-pasteurize. You can dig into these piles and bring them out. It's already a ready-made compost. Uh, you add spawn to it, and then people go, and this is, this is outdoor cultivation with hoops and black plastic, or what we call remake cloth, which is a kind of a bug out cloth. Uh, and you can do outdoor, uh, or, or bed cultivation, and grow literally hundreds and hundreds of pounds outdoors, you know, kind of semi-naturally. Uh, the advantage of this is you have entropy as an ally. Should you have uh, insects coming in, they go away, and there's natural, uh, predators out there to, to the insects. So th this is one of the more favored ways and, and really not discussed by anybody in any book. Uh, that is the simplest way to, in a sense, fly under cover uh, of the U.S. government uh, because the growing cycle is very short. It's outdoors. It, it doesn't kind of meet the, the 
the description of a laboratory, underground drug laboratory, is more in the garden environment, in amongst the vegetables, etc. So it's a very, very simple way of growing massive amounts of Slossus bucumensis in a very, very short time. Um, and you can grow it also on pasteurized wheat straw, as is shown here. Um, more Slossus bucumensis. When you're getting over about four pounds per square foot, or two kilograms, I don't know what it converts to in square meters. Uh, Two, uh, two to five pounds per square foot of Slossopy cubensis fresh weight. That's pretty much uh, the, the average good yield. And when you're a master cultivator, you're getting seven pounds per square foot, uh, which is fresh weight. So that's almost three quarters of a pound dry weight. Uh, very significant. It's a beautiful mushroom. Many of you here have grown it, uh, grown it and fallen in love with it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a majestic mushroom. And when the partial veil begins to tear, the first partial veil, that is a holy ceremony for many of us cultivators. Because as the first mushrooms develop and the first veil tears, you can watch it tear in about half an hour to an hour. And, it, and it's a joyous moment. And it's one that should always be celebrated. For those of you who are, who are cultivators, I encourage you to pick up that ritual. <coughs> So, and then there was a, a, a plethora of other books that came out. This is the Leonard Enos book, which was really, uh, it was the first book, and I give him credit for that, but it was a terrible book. Um, it was a, a largely a ripoff of other people's work and had a lot of misinformation in it. Uh, but there was also some other books that were not very good. This is probably the next to the worst book ever published on mushrooms. <laughs> um, and then this book here says that, you know, you can use metol, uh, which is a, photographic reagent and it stains mushrooms blue, then the mushrooms are psilocybin active. That's patently false. You know? uh, so there was a lot of misinformation that was being published. Um, and then, I, in the course of the past 20 years, um, I've, I've produced these books. Um, this, is, this is my first field guide. This book now sold over 100,000 copies and still sells more each year, which is like totally surprising to me because it came out in 1983. And this is the book that I'm very proud of, and this is 600 pages long. And it's mostly on the cultivation of gourmet and medicinal mushrooms. There is a section on the cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms outdoors in that book as well. And then my more recent book, this one here, which literally sat in a drawer. Many of you have started big projects. Anybody who has written a book here knows, especially Christian's last book. I mean, that's a clear example. It nearly killed him writing it. That's no exaggeration. Because when you got, get involved in these projects, if you conceive the enormity of the entire project all at once, you'd never start it. But there's something about this subject, and these mushrooms inspire us, and these plants inspire us, that give us the courage and the strength and the stamina to go on. Uh, so any of you who have built a house, who have done other books, you know, my sympathy and empathy is with you, because it's, it's, it's a very lonesome project. No one really is there, is there to do it but yourself. But it's the same thing as building a house in my mind. It's, you know, so, um, so the number of mushrooms that, that more of the prominent species that I want to cover, this is a photograph by Jim Jacobs. This is Slosby Mexicana, known as Teananacato, uh, or God's Flesh. This is, uh, this is one of the mushrooms that was revered uh, by Mesoamericans uh, uh, for centuries prior to the invasion of the Spaniards who brought cattle with them and the Slosby cubensis is associated with a Spanish invasion. So Slosby cubensis traditionally in the past, you know, 50 years have been given to tourists. And Slosby mexicana and these other mushrooms are revered and used for private religious, private religious ceremonies uh, by native peoples. So Slosby mexicana is uh, what I call the liberty cap of, of Mesoamerica. It looks very, very similar to Slosby semilanciata. And uh, Slosby mexicana can easily be grown. It produces sclerotia, which can be harvested, and they're like potato-like structures. Uh, and then you can uh, bury them in soil, and then mushrooms come up. And this is one of the, the sweetest and dearest mushrooms that I've grown. Because uh, to me, it's like God touched the top of every mushroom. And it's like a sunburst. And I, I, I feel a strong affection for the species. Um, Slosby tamponensis. We were at one of the coffee shops and they had fresh sclerotia, Slosby tamponensis, right beside sushi. I mean, where else in the world can you get sushi and Slosby tamponensis sclerotia side by side? But in Amsterdam, I love this city. Uh, and it is very similar in appearance to the temperate 
uh, relative Salasabi Semilanciata, which we, you have here in Holland. Uh, and Salasabi Semilanciata is a very safe mushroom to pick. Uh, it tends to grow exclusively in pasture lands, and there's very few poisonous species uh, that are like it. Um, it is a mushroom which does not bruise bluish very readily, in fact, quite rarely, uh, but it has some other features that are uniquely specific to it. It has a separable gelatinous pellicle and an acute umbo, and I'll show those in just a second. And a uh, species that I have been uh, blessed in that I've published now four novel species in the genus Psilocybe in scientific uh, journals in Latin. Uh, and this is my answer to Psilocybe liniformis variety liniformis here in Holland. We have a variety called Psilocybe liniformis variety americana, uh, which, which I published with Dr. Gaston Guzman in, in 1981. Psilocybe liniformis here in, in Europe has an edge that you can peel off with a pin. That's why it's called liniformis. It's got a white fringe that you can peel off the gill. And that is specific to that mushroom, and there's no other species that I know of that is, that is similar to it. So this is my, one of the first species that I published. And then a species that was surrounded by a lot of taxonomic debate is one that was recently clarified. And we can know this one as Psilocybe strictipes, or strictipes. And this grows uh, in, particularly um, in, in Oregon, where there's a, an enormous industry in growing grass seed. Uh, for lawns and golf courses, etc. And there's no manure, and as a result, there's no, there's no cows, and there's no fences. So it's a great place to go mushroom hunting because you can stop the car, and uh, literally there's about a 20 to 30 mile band about of, of, of farmland, so to speak, and about 100, 200 miles long where they grow the majority of grass seed for, for uh, all the users uh, in North America and elsewhere. This is fantastic too because in this photograph here, there is no ex exaggeration. There's probably several million mushrooms, which means all the spore mass is going into the soil. So as the seeds are being uh, harvested later on, uh, then that spore mass is being spread to golf courses, you know, government buildings, you know, yards. I mean, it truly is an invisible revolution. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, philosophy. Strictipes looks very similar to Slosby semilanciata. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to get into all the, all the nuances, so I need to, to jump ahead here. But many of these uh, temperate psilocybin active mushroom species in the genus Psilocybe have a cap, which means that the cap is really, when it's wet, it's real dark, but then as it dries, it fades to yellow. So that is one of the key features in the temperate psilocybin active species. Um, it also has, this, they, many of them, uh, including liniformans, including including Semilanciata and Strictipes, have a separable gelatinous pellicle, which when you break the cap and, and break it apart, you can see this translucent skin. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is what it looks like under the microscope. And this, this gelatinized layer is, is a predominant taxonomic feature. But these are kind of the minor features, and I'm going to show you some, some of the more major features here in a second. Let's... Uh, so, at the Psilocybin State College near Olympia, Washington, where, where Jonathan and I went to school, this person is not looking for a contact lens. <laughs> this is, is the Psilocybe mushroom stoop, you know, as we know it. And it's characteristic when you see a student do this, it's a, it's a call, you know, to all other students to come help. Uh, <laughs> The difficulty in the Northwest is because it, it is, was, you know, recently totally forested. Uh, we have um, wood chips in the, on the ground, and then lawns are laid on top. So those of us who wanted to write habitat-specific field guides, where we'd say in the fields, Slosby semilanciata grows, you know, in wood chips, Slosby cyanescens grows, it becomes very complicated because you could find wood decomposing mushrooms like cyanescens, uh, uh, ambiocystis, etc., growing in areas that have, been, have lawns. Uh, so it's it become very problematic. But these lawns are fantastic because of the wood chips underneath and the sprinkler systems that come on all the time. So it's a beautiful, beautiful environment encouraging encouraging psilocybin mushrooms to grow. So at the Evergreen State College, where I was doing my research, I could literally walk out of the laboratory building, and within 20 feet, no exaggeration, I could find four different species in the genus Psilocybe. Uh, and I know now that from the, uh, the reports of my professor, who's a very straight individual, um, he has five or six species growing in his yard at home. 
And he asked me, where did they come from, Paul? You know, and I said, geez, Mike, you know, you have all these mushrooms laying around your office all the time. Where do you think they came from? So um, clearly they impregnated his clothes and he went home and threw out his garbage or mowed his yard or tended his garden and he spread his spore mass. So, you know, humans are vehicles for spreading psilocybe spores. Now, humans have a peculiar and an unfortunate characteristic. There's no other organism on this planet where it creates greater d debris trails uh, in the environment than humans. We're, we're devastators, you know? We should be homo, homo, homo sapien devastators or something, you know, as our name. Because we go through environments where we wreak havoc. But the psilocybin active mushrooms have developed a very quick and unique response. They hitchhike on the activities of humans. So the chipping of wood, the laying down of lawns, uh, allow these species to predominate. So these mushrooms are growing now, sometimes to the exclusion of other species. So a species that is unique to Washington and Oregon and British Columbia is Psilocybe stuntsii, uh, named after Daniel Stuntz. And I don't believe there's any reports uh, in Europe. It's very similar in some ways morphologically to cyanescence. I mean, you know, I don't think so, but just as a general morphology. And this is in my professor's backyard, and it has an annulus or a ring on the stem here that uh, turns bluish. Uh, a species unfortunately growing in the same habitat is a deadly poison species by the name of Gallerona atomnalis. Uh, so in the Northwest, there was great concern uh, for accurately showing people how to distinguish between psilocybes and gallerinas. Gallerinas produce rusty brown spores, psilocybes produce purple brown spores. And that is the first and primary significant feature that you need to know in trying to identify psilocybin mushrooms. All mushrooms in the genus psilocybe produce purple brown spores, like you saw earlier with the spore prints of Slosby commences on the hat and on the paper. Gallerinus produce rusty brown spores. This is a ring of death, is that what I call it? Enough Gallerinus to probably kill a dozen people, uh, with the late Stephen Pollock here in, in front of it. Um, and so there's a major concerns because I took this photograph and here's Slosby stuntsia growing side by side with Slosby, uh, with Gallerina adonalis, so close that the mushrooms are touching each other. And we put out the warning in the 1970s, and there was actually physicians discouraging information, and my colleagues discouraging the spread of accurate information identifying psilocybin mushrooms because they were prejudiced against the people who were collecting them. And it was a violation, frankly, of their medical code uh, to discourage people with uh, to how to accurately identify these mushrooms. So. Uh, Several books, including my own, warn people about that, but unfortunately several people have died in North America from mistakenly eating, eating the gallerinas. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up here in about five minutes, um, if I can. This is a, this, the, one of the species that I published uh, with, with Dr. Gaston Guzman, and it's called uh, Psilocybe cyanofibulosa. Uh, and it grows site-specifically underneath rhododendrons. So if you come to Washington or Oregon or British Columbia and you want to find psilocybe mushrooms, go to a rhododendron garden. It's the easiest place to find them. Rhododendron gardens use lots of wood chips. They use cardboard to suppress weeds. They tend to have be lots of shade, multiple canopies, perfect environments for encouraging psilocybe mushrooms to grow. And uh, Slosib cyanofibulosa is named because blue hairs on the on the stem, and the blue hairs turn slightly blue. Now uh, the the blue is bluish, and the cap can expand to fully plain, and it's non-undulate, very different than cyanescence, and the the bruising here. And it has bifurcate or a splitting chylocystidia, which is a microscopic feature on the gills, which distinguishes it. That's this species from a whole group of other psilocybe species that look generally similar. And then this is the second and most significant feature, and most all of you are aware of this, is that mushrooms which contain high amounts of psilocin, or psilocin, however you want to pronounce it, bruise bluish. So the combination of having a purple-brown spore print and the fact that mushroom bruises bluish, those two conditions met, without a doubt, you have entered into an arena of psilocybin active species. There's some bluing strophereas, which are not poisonous and are questionably uh, psilocybin active or somewhat similar, but 98% of the species that are psilocybin uh, active, that are potent, uh, that produce psilocin, have this bluing reaction. So if you pick a mushroom that has purple-brown spore print and it bruises bluish, then try it, eat it. Uh, it's not gonna be a poisonous mushroom, it'll be a psilocybin active mushroom probably. 
Um, this is this is Slosby biocystis, uh, which is a very rare and hard to find species in Washington, uh, and it blends in with the background, and it's also very very potent. And there's uh, lots of stories associated with this that I don't have time to get into. Another example of Slosby biocystis. And one of the more exciting mushrooms, which we also have, we have in here here in Europe, is a uh, is Slosby cyanescens, and uh, this is one of my favorite mushrooms to eat. Um, and it has an undulating margin that's like a sine wave for you mathematicians out there. And it's something that is very, very easy to identify. And uh, for my own sacred mushroom patches, I like to build shrines. Many of us do. And this is my mushroom shrine. And this lots to be essence growing at the base of it. And um, I don't, you know... Uh, grow many philosophies. I don't need to. I mean, I don't even need to possess them. I can go out into the into the wilderness or into the cities and find them. Uh, so I mean, there's like no reason for me to even grow them anymore because they're so easy for me to find. Um, now, there's a peculiar circumstance that if, if you're in the city and you can't find a rhododendron garden, where do you go in October, uh, September, and October, and November in the state of Washington, and Oregon, and British Columbia? You go to police stations, government office buildings. Uh, you know, hospitals. Uh, John Allen is here in the audience, and he probably has accumulated more hours of collecting psilocybe mushrooms in urban environments than anybody in this planet. You know, and it's amazing. You know, when you don't trek out into the wilderness to find psilocybe, if you're in Washington, Oregon, you look for mountains of wood chips being used for landscaping, which typically is funded by the U.S. government. So the U.S. government is actively involved in promoting habitats, growing psilocybe mushrooms all the time. And this also is a problem because in the state of Washington, the, uh, where I live, in, near Olympia, the biggest philosophy science essence patch I've ever seen is around the Thurston County Courthouse in jail. And I think it's there by no, by no mistake. Because they, they prosecuted people for collecting these mushrooms and they bring them into the courthouse system, they will concentrate all these individuals carrying spore mass into the courthouse and as a result spread spores all around that environment. So I think that prosecuting people for psilocybin mushrooms is antithetical to the very biology and the way that these mushrooms work. By the mere act of trying to prosecute individuals, you cultivate them. And I think... Okay, Christian, can I five more minutes, right? Five more minutes, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, this, this is a photograph of of Christian uh, two years ago, and this is uh, the third species uh, that, that, I, that I published with, with Dr. Gartz, who's here in the audience. Uh, and this is uh, where the native uh, habitat for Philosophy azurescens is. It's at, literally at the junction of the Columbia River, which is a mammoth river, one of the largest rivers in North America, as it joins into the Pacific Ocean. At the cusp of the Columbia River meeting the Pacific Ocean, there's these sand dunes and uh, spits of land that go out into the ocean. At that very junction, where there's massive amounts of wind and, and you know tremendous devastation from the environment, this mushroom grows in profusion, almost to the exclusion of other species. And it is known as Slosophy azurescens. Uh, and it's called azurescens because the mushrooms, you blow on them, they turn blue. They're so potent. They have, they have fibrils on the stem that just, it just to emanate this glowing azure color. And then the mushrooms are also notably quite large. And uh, this mushroom here, I think, dried down to about five grams. So for you QB cultivators out there, you know what that means. Uh, and it also has, has a very strong hygrophonous cap and has rhizomorphs at the base of stem. Now, in my next book, all of you growing Psilocybe cubensis, Psilocybe azurescens, Psilocybe cyanescens, this is stuff I can't talk about in the United States, you can cut the base of the stem here from the rhizom and get bundles of rhizomorphs, sandwich it in cardboard, and all these stem butts regrow as spawn. You don't have to buy spawn or spores or anything from anybody else. Once you get the mushrooms and try this, it's fantastically easy. You just cut the base of the stem with the rhizomorphs here, wet corrugated cardboard, separate it, put the stem butts, lay it into the cardboard, laminate it over it, spray it you know, several times a week. And all the stem butts regrow into spawn, and you end up with a huge amount of mycelium, then they can relaunch out into the environment. It's a coup d'etat technique that I think will revolu revolutionize. And we all have too much cardboard around. Philosophy azurescence is, is one of the, the most beautiful mushrooms. This is, this is one of my better photographs of it. Uh, and it's a mushroom that I, I, 
I feel a strong bond with. It is no mushroom to play with. It is extremely potent. And, uh, and as all of these entheogens, um, we all need to respect them. And you can, sometimes you can only respect them by, by doing too much. <laughs> and then you really know what you're dealing with. So, um, but it's a very, very potent species, far more potent than other ones. And um, it's very beautiful. We call it the flying saucer mushroom. It tends to be umbinate. It has an even cap margin, not undulating. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to grow. Like cyanescence, but not twice the kick, twice the potency. And they can be, as you can see, relatively large. And they bruise so dark blue they can become indigo black. They're that high in silicon. Uh, psil psilocybin dephosphorylates into psilocin, and when you test the mushrooms, you're getting off on psilocin, not psilocybin. So psilocin, presence of the blooming reaction is the indicator, probably of a co-degradation pathway of a compound yet, yet unknown, which has a blue pigment. But it's a direct correlation for how potent the mushrooms once were. And then another mushroom that we have in the Northwest is very uh, common in, in the ancient old growth and along trails, the Psilocybe pelliculosa. The sister species, Psilocybe sylvatica. Uh, Psilocybe pelliculosa can grow right beside Galeron adamnalis, also a, a deadly poisonous species. And then the, the last species that I've published to date, I named after Dr. Andrew Weil, who is uh, a naturopathic physician in the United States, of some well-known. And this mushroom grows at these interface environments. Many of these do, between grasslands and shrubs. And this is now named and published as Psilocybe wileyi, after Andrew Weil. And it grows in northern Georgia, which is the center of conservatism in North America. So right in the middle of the most conservative Baptist community, this mushroom comes up. I think it's like, it knows, right? <laughs> and so um, I was very thankful when I saw this came out last week. This is a, uh, an article by Nordelus. Uh, which re-examined the type collections of some of the major psilocybin active species. And in this mycological journal, he used the photographs in my most recent book, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World, uh, as icon photographs representative of the species concept. So I'm very thankful uh, and very delighted that the taxonomy that I have proposed in my book has held, up the, held the test of time and now has been selected out by other mycologists as true examples of the epitome of what the species concept should look like. And um, so I just want to close. Um, this is our homepage for people who haven't uh, surfed into it. Uh, and this came to me uh, when I was driving down the highway and smoked a joint and listening to the Grateful Dead Terrapin Station, one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite Grateful Dead uh, songs. And it came to me, now, what is this about mushroom mycelium? Because when lightning strikes, mushrooms come up. The mycelium is rhizomorphic, it resembles neurons. And I, now there has been a report of a meteorite that came from Mars that was found in the Arctic, where mushroom-like mycelial structures have actually been identified. And I believe that this simple replication, this linear replication of cells, is a successful model that is being repeated throughout the universe. Uh, Terence McKenna was one of the first people to, to propose that mushrooms may have come from outer space. And the more that I studied this subject, I think he's right. I think that these, these forms are self-replicating. Nature builds upon successful models. And I think that these mushrooms, and, and even psilocybin mushrooms, may indeed be in the future common throughout the universe. Thank you very much.